And again, thank you, friends, for coming and joining us at this special Prophecy Encounter Canada program. We're really enjoying our time up here. We're having some very important studies in prophecy. Now, tonight we're going to be talking about this subject, the woman of light. And I'd like to begin with uh, an amazing fact. Sad fact. 2016, a family, the Gray family, were vacationing in Disney World. And in the evening, the father and the mother and their two young children, Lane Grave, was a two-year-old boy, was playing by the lagoon there at the Disney World Hotel. They were watching the movie Zootopia, and they were waiting in the water at the edge. The parents were watching them. And out of nowhere, an alligator came, snatched the boy. The father saw what was happening. He ran off in the water, leaped on the alligator, and it swam away with his son. The boy, some of you heard this in the news, the boy's body was found about 16 hours later and they were devastated. There that dragon wanted to devour the man-child, which is part of our study tonight. But the amazing thing to me in this story, it's not the first time that's happened in Florida, is this family, they had the possibility of now suing Disney World for probably millions of dollars. And they probably would have won at least something. And when they were asked later, they said, no, we've chosen not to. We are going to forgive. And that, to me, is the most incredible thing. They said, we want to move on with our lives. We've been hurt enough. We don't want to go through a painful court process. We're just going to move on. And although all the attorneys thought, you're crazy. You could just take all that money. And they said, no, we don't, we don't want to do that. It, they didn't intend for it to happen. There's nothing they could do to prevent it. Alligators roam all over that country. We're not going to sue. And I thought, that is so unusual to have that degree of forgiveness. How many people today would turn down millions of dollars after going through a crisis like that and say, we just want to go on living our lives? Well, you know, in the Bible, it talks about a battle that takes place between a dragon and a woman and a man-child. Our study tonight is almost completely going to be based on Revelation chapter 12. This, of course, is a prophecy encounter program. Let me read this for you. And I'm just going to start by reading the first um, six verses. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland or a crown of 12 stars. Then being with child, she's pregnant, great with child, she cries out in labor and pain to give birth. The scene switches, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. And he drew, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God in his throne. The dragon did not get the child. The child is caught up to God in his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Now I'm going to jump down to verse 13. We've covered some of verse 7 to verse 12. Now the dragon, when he saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and a times and half a time. That's again three and a half, the same as the 1260. From the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and it opened its mouth and swallowed the flood that the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, the remnant of her seed, that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, there's the prophecy. What is that talking about? What does a woman represent? Church. We talked the other night about the woman in Revelation 17 that sits among seven hills, that's clothed with the purple and the scarlet and, and so forth. Now we're talking about the antithesis of that, which is a woman, a woman who is pure. She's clothed with light. One is clothed with artificial adornment. This one is clothed with God's creative light. 
And we're going to find out what that means. So how does Revelation picture God's true church? Once again, we read Revelation 12, verse 1, 2, and 5. A woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head, 12 stars. You know, you look in Genesis, it says God created the sun, moon, and stars on the fourth day. That's the natural light that we have in the heavens. It's the light of God. Jesus said to the church, you are the light of the world. Do not hide your light under a bush, right? That's the, the light of the Old Testament. She's clothed with the sun, the brilliance of the sun. And uh, that's the light of the New Testament, the fulfillment of Christ. And above her head are 12 stars. That's talking about the leadership in particular, the 12 apostles. And so here is this woman who is going to be bringing forth a man-child. Do you need to guess who the man-child is? She cries being with child. She travails in birth. She pained to be delivered. And I told you there are seven examples in the Bible of barren women who miraculously then brought forth children. And all the children were types of Christ. Um, Isaac was the result of a miracle birth. Sarah was barren. Isaac went up the mountain as a sacrifice with his father, a type of Jesus. Samson was born of a barren woman. He's a miracle birth. Samson, he was handed over by his own people. His people bound him and handed him to the Philistines. Jesus was bound and handed to the pagans, the Romans. Samson was sold by someone he loved. A woman he loved sold him for silver. Jesus loved the church and yet he was sold out by his own people. Samson stretches out his arms and he lays down his life. Samson was blinded. Jesus had a bag put over his head. He was blinded. Samson is a type of Christ. You read about the Shunammite woman. She brings forth a miracle son because of the prayer of Elisha. The boy is working in the field with his father and he dies. But he is resurrected. Now isn't that a type of Jesus? A boy being resurrected? And so you look at these examples of the miracle babies, and I didn't list them all. John the Baptist is one. You look, Samuel is one. Hannah's barren. She prays at the temple. God gives her a miraculous baby. Samuel becomes a prophet, a judge, and a priest. Jesus is our prophet, our judge, and our priest. So they're all types of Christ. And here is this final, ultimate woman who's bringing forth this man-child. All of these miracle men-child in the Bible are all sort of coalescing in Christ. Christ is the ultimate miracle birth, right? And so, but the dragon, who is that? The devil wants to devour the man-child as soon as it's born. And he sends his soldiers out to try and stop that. She brings forth a man-child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now, do we need to guess who the man-child is? The Bible tells us other places in Revelation and even in the Psalms, God rules with a rod of iron. That was the strongest metal they had back then. And it's talking about a strong king. So this is all telling us about Jesus. Then it says her child is caught up to God in his throne. After Jesus taught and he lived and he died for humanity, he ascended to heaven into the presence of God. So it's very clear who the man-child is, right? Remember the first prophecy in the Old Testament. It talks about in Genesis chapter 3, 15. I'll put enmity between the serpent and the woman, between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, and there'd be this battle. And so you see all the way down, now you get to Revelation, you got a serpent, the woman, and the seed of the woman. So this theme of a battle between the devil and his children and Christ and his children goes all the way through. Just because you go to church doesn't mean you're a child of God. Jesus said to the religious leaders that went to church, you're not children of God. You're children of your father, the devil. You know he said that? That's not very political, is it? Not politically correct to say that. If you're going to be a child of God, Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. So it's one thing to say, Lord, Lord. It's another thing to really be following the word. So we read on here. Now, what does a woman represent? I have likened the daughter of Zion, this is Jeremiah 6, 2, to a delicate and comely woman, to a beautiful woman, this woman of light. You read the last chapter in Proverbs, it talks about the perfect wife. And it just tells, says all these beautiful things about this perfect, ideal woman. Never says who this was. And it's really an allegory of God's bride, the church. Have you read the Song of Solomon? Song of Solomon is a love story between Christ and his bride. And um, 
And there's other things you can learn from that, but it's really the love story. It's a symbol of that. And so all through the Bible, you've got this. When God's church was unfaithful, God told Hosea, I want you to go take a wife who is a prostitute. I said, what? He said, yep, I want you to illustrate to the people what they have done to me. I am their God, I'm their husband, but they have gone whoring after other gods. So when God's people were unfaithful, he referred to his church as a prostitute. When they were faithful to the word, he said that they were light in the world. So this is God's church in the ideal state. And again, say unto Zion, the church, thou art my people. Zion, like a beautiful, delicate woman. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So a woman is a symbol for the church. Now, who is the great red dragon? Uh, do we have to spend a lot of time on that? It says right there in that same passage, the great dragon was cast out that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. You've got a dragon, serpent, devil, Satan. We know who he is. He's the ultimate arch villain who is the, the most cold-hearted of all. And there you have that passage, the dragon, that old alligator, stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. Did the devil make an effort as soon as Jesus was born to kill him as a baby? When Herod, through the Roman power, sent soldiers into Bethlehem, and that's foretold in the Old Testament that that would happen. Rachel weeping for her children, and they are not. So it's... Um, uh, the Herod tried to kill Jesus as a baby. The dragon tried to devour Christ, but God delivered Jesus at that time. And I told you there are two other examples where the devil tried to wipe out a savior. He killed all the baby boys in Egypt, or tried when Moses was born. He tried to kill the uh, male children of David when Athaliah was queen. And her son died. She didn't want one of the sons of David to reign. By the way, she's the daughter of Jezebel. Athaliah was the daughter of Jezebel. You know, Jezebel was a bad queen. Yeah, you ever met anybody that names their daughter Jezebel? No. Kind of an infamous name. And so you've got several examples of this in the Bible. Now, just want to pause here and say something. You probably, if you travel, you will see pictures of Mary. Here's one I just grabbed. And she sometimes is standing on the moon. She's clothed with light, and she has 12 stars above her head. They often say, well, that woman was Mary in Revelation chapter 12. I respectfully disagree because it says later the woman flees into the wilderness and the dragon tries to devour her. Mary moved in with the apostle John, and she died in Antioch, as near as we know. She never went through these experiences. Mary is a type of the church, but the woman in Revelation 12 is not Mary. Can you show me somewhere in the Bible where we are commanded to pray to Mary? No. no. Was Mary a godly woman? Yes. yes. She was chosen by the Lord, had a wonderful job. Was she ever guilty of sin? Yeah, the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's only one that has not sinned, and who is that? Jesus. Are we supposed to pray to Mary? It doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. And so, I mean, I know a lot of sincere people do that, but we are supposed to pray to God through the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Never does it say that we pray through a person to reach God, right? If you would like more information on what we have been studying today, we have a comprehensive Bible study guide we would love to share with you, and it's absolutely free. This study includes many of the texts we have just read and expands on the subject, including information you will want to know. To receive this free and informative Bible study guide, simply call, write, or email us and ask for free offer number displayed on your screen. Our toll-free number is 1-877-721-3887. Okay, and so her child is caught up unto God and to his throne. That, again, of course, is Jesus. Now, after Jesus ascends to heaven, after he's caught up to heaven, what does Satan now do to the church? You can read here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 13. It says, When the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. So when Jesus ascended to heaven and the devil realized he could not get to the church anymore, the devil then vented his fury on God's people. Now this is very simple. The devil hates Jesus. The big battle is between Christ and the devil. 
Does the devil want to hurt Jesus? Yeah. But now Jesus is out of his reach. So the way to hurt Jesus is by hurting what Jesus loves. Who does Jesus love? He loves us. The devil doesn't understand it, but he knows it. Now, if I want to hurt you, what would hurt you more? To torture you or to torture your child in front of you? So why is the devil turning on the woman now? Because he can't reach Jesus. He's trying to hurt God by hurting the woman. So what happened to the church after Christ ascended to heaven? You probably heard the stories about Christianity was soon declared forbidden religion. And so the Romans began to persecute Christians. Even during the time of Paul, you read it in the New Testament, the emperor expelled all of the Jews from Rome. And many of the Christians went out too because they believed the same God, they believed in the same scriptures, and they were all evicted from Rome. And because the Jews got into a battle with Rome, the Romans, figuring the Christians were sort of a, a division of Judaism, they began to attack Christians and Jews. And it became what they call religio illicite, or illicit or forbidden religion. Romans had lots of gods, and they allowed lots of other religions, but Christianity became forbidden. Christians had to go underground. And you've heard of Nero. You know, under the reign of Nero, Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was beheaded. Christians were burnt at the stake. They were told, unless you worship our gods, you're going to be thrown to the lions in the Colosseum. You're going to be butchered by the gladiators. They would set them on fire. You, you heard that Nero would light his gardens. He'd smear pitch on Christians and put them on poles and set them on fire alive. And he was brutal. And he died a brutal death too. But uh, there was a great period of persecution. The most severe persecution under the Romans, you read about in Revelation, took place, it says, over a period of 10 years during the church of Smyrna. There was great persecution from 303 to 313 under the emperor Diocletian. He wanted to eradicate Christianity. But the more he persecuted the Christians, the more the church grew. It's like the church father Tertullian said, the seed uh, or the blood of the martyrs is like seed. You ever try to get rid of weeds by mowing them? <laughs> you mow them down, you just spread the weeds. It's like mowing dandelions. They just spread everywhere. And that's what happened. The more they tried to mow down the Christians, and what would happen is the Romans would go to the Colosseums to be entertained by the Christians being killed before the main act. And when they let the lions loose on them, they were calm, and they prayed, and they sang, and they were fearless. And the pagans had so much fear. They thought, well, how do they get this peace? And they would start asking, hey, do you know any Christians? I like to talk to them. And even though they were building cities underneath Rome in the catacombs, a lot of people turned to the Christians and said, what is it you, ha you guys have? You know, the reason I became a Christian, I was a pagan. I met some Christians that just were so happy. I was always looking for happiness through drugs and alcohol. And I said, you guys aren't using anything and you're happy. You're high all the time. What are you doing? And I found out about Jesus, and it was attractive. The gospel is good news. We should make it attractive. Amen? Amen? But as Christianity began to grow, the Roman emperor came along who was pretty shrewd, Constantine. They called him Constantine the Great. His mother converted to Christianity. Well, that would make it difficult to make it illegal. He knew a lot of Christians. He said, they're not really hurting anybody. And according to history, he was involved in a battle with uh, the, the Maximilian Bridge with another, there's a split in the Roman Empire. And he claims that he saw the sign of the cross in the sky and that a voice told him he would now conquer under the sign of the cross. He knew very little about Christianity, only what he learned from his mother. And he kind of declared it was now an officially acceptable religion. In fact, he ordered his army to march through the Tiber River in Rome. I think I told you this. And he says, they're going, why? He says, now you've been baptized. You're all Christians. Well, when you add people to the church like that, and they're not taught, and they're pagans, and you just say, now you're Christians. They say, okay, you're the boss, whatever you say. All of these pagan teachings came pouring into the church. So pretty soon you had a milkshake of Christianity and paganism. The Roman religion just got all mixed up. And... Um, idolatry almost overnight came in, a number of ceremonies and things that just really weren't in the Bible. Um, the idea, for example, if you're good, you go to heaven, and if you're bad, you go to hell. The Bible does say there's a heaven and there's a hell. 
But does the Bible say you go right to heaven and hell or are you supposed to wait till the resurrection and the judgment? The Bible says you sleep until the resurrection and the judgment. Now, if you're saved and you die, your next conscious thought is the resurrection, right? Whether it's the good resurrection or bad resurrection. So you, it's instant for you if you die. But it hasn't happened for us because we live in time. Jesus said, at the second coming, the dead in Christ will rise. The judgment is the last day. That is all still in the future, correct? But they started saying, look, if you're good, you go to heaven, but you might have to go to purgatory. You might need to be purged from your sins for a little while, but if you pay us enough money, we'll pray for you and get you out of purgatory, and only the priest can do this. And if you're bad, you go to hell right away. And you will burn there forever and ever and ever. Now, does the Bible teach that? The Bible says the wicked will be consumed. They will be devoured. They will perish. Heaven, there'll be no more tears, no more pain, no more death, no more crying. But now the church began to teach a place of everlasting torment. Is there a lake of fire? Yes, it's in Revelation. But does it burn for billions and zillions of years without end, people writhing in flames? God sort of became a sadist. People started coming to church not because they loved God, but they were terrified of hell. And that's not the reason to serve him, right? So all of these things began to change that were not the teachings of Jesus. Jesus said, fear not him who can destroy your body, but he cannot hurt your soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy, Matthew chapter 10, destroy soul and body in hell. What happens to the lost? Soul and body destroyed. They will be consumed. They perish. Never are they anymore. God makes a new heaven, a new earth. All these teachings began to change. They came from Greek mythology. How many of you have heard pictures of the devil being in charge of hell? He's got a pitchfork. and Where's that in the Bible? The devil is getting cast into hell. He's not in charge. But they started all these strange mythological teachings began to creep into the church. And many good Christian teachings, but many false teachings too. Constantine was the one who was almost uh, solely responsible for helping effect this change. Almost overnight, when Constantine legalized Christianity, his mother was a Christian. Everybody suddenly thought it was very cool to be a Christian. And all these pagans, without reading the Bible, converted. And they began to persecute the Christians who said, you guys are drifting from the Bible. They said, oh, you guys, you're stuck in the mud. You're old-fashioned. They said, you've got to get with it. This is now the modern religion. And the ones who said, no, you're changing things. We've got to stick to the Bible they now became the persecuted. So the genuine Christians were not accepted by the political Christians who had the power and they had the buildings now. And a great split took place in the church. And all of a sudden the church itself became a persecuting power. Now, did Jesus ever torture someone that didn't choose to follow him? No, people, he said, follow me if they didn't. He said, I love you anyway, you know. He never forced people to believe. If you have a religion that says your people are not allowed to look at any other teaching, there's something, your, your religion is afraid to stand up under investigation. If you've got a religion that says if you leave our church, we're going to shun you or kill you, there's something wrong with your religion. You shouldn't have to force people. And during the dark ages that came now, all of a sudden now the church became the state they mixed and they began to persecute if people did not believe the way they were told. They started forcing belief. Can you force a person's heart? Jesus wants our hearts. So a terrible darkness came over the church. Part of this happened because they took the Bibles away from the people. They were afraid if they read the Bible, they'd find out that salvation's a gift and you cannot pay for it. They'd find out that you don't go right to hell and burn forever and ever before a judgment day or, and some of these false teachings. And they took the Bibles, they chained them in monasteries, they started teaching the religion in a foreign language of Latin that only a few people still spoke. The average people didn't know what the Bible said, and there was great darkness. The Bible is a light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. You take away the light, what do you have? So these were the dark ages. So during this time, where did the woman go? You read that when the dragon began to persecute the woman, she fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should nourish and feed her there for 1,260 days. That's that time period we talked about from the beginning of the church being a political and a military power, 538 A.D., 
until they lost their power in 1798. There's that time period we've got up on the screen where those years of persecution when the church was in the wilderness. During that time, many faithful Christians, you've maybe heard of the Waldenses, the Albigenses, the Hussites, and, and a lot of Christians had to flee into the wilderness, quite literally, flee the cities, because the established church was a political, religious, military power, and it would persecute. And it made things very difficult. It happened exactly from 538 to 1798. You know what that time period is? You got 1,260 days, and in prophecy, what is a day? It's a year. 1,260 years. Now, that time period is very interesting. If you know your Bible, how many of you remember, if you know your Bible, you read about Elijah? A famine during the days of Elijah. Why? Because a wicked pagan queen, Jezebel, married Ahab, wicked king. They persecuted the prophets. Prophets had to flee into a wilderness. Uh, they were fed by Obadiah with bread. For how long? 1,260 days, literal days. Right? During the time of Jesus, Christ was haunted and dogged and persecuted. How long did he preach? From his baptism to the cross, 1,260 days, 42 months, three and a half years. Same time period. So just like you had Jezebel persecuting the prophets during this famine and Elijah went into the wilderness and God fed Elijah with bread from heaven with a raven, during the dark ages, God's church fled into the wilderness. He fed her with the word of God. They had little pieces of scripture and they would get together and they would hand copy the scriptures and they kept the church alive. Join us each week as we share the Word of God that will change your life. We welcome you to check out our website, AmazingFactsMinistries.com, where you can sign up for free online Bible studies, check out our resource catalog, and watch our weekly video broadcasts. If you have a specific prayer request or a question on a topic from the Bible, send us an email and we will add you to our prayer list and help answer your questions. Our email address is contact at amazingfactsministries.com.